Why are recruitment selections so important in talent management? It's one of those questions that seems strange. I mean, you obviously think, well, of course it's important to recruit and select the right people. But let's have a look. What is so key about it? Well, one of the first things you need to consider, of course, is that uh, on our topic that I run at the moment, human resources downstream in this process. Human resources is the first place where people are brought in for the company, where people are recruitment selection, it's human resources who write the adverts, human resources who write the job specs, etc. They may get the details from elsewhere, but it's human resources that is the connection to the external parts of the organisation. These days, of course, with many companies, the external labour market is becoming much more important. Companies tend to recruit externally for new roles. They know what they've got internally. They'll be looking to add to that a lot of the time. The Joel job for life, where you can move your way up the company by stages, seems to have disappeared. It's now much more important to move outside the company, get more experience, and then possibly to come back later on. But it varies an awful lot. I remember the very first job I had as a insurance, I was told if I left the company, I would never be welcome back. That effectively, they wanted people to stay in the company all their lives. If you chose to go on somewhere else, then that was your choice. But don't expect that you'll be have an opportunity to return to the company. That has completely disappeared now. In only 20 odd years, it's now more common for companies to encourage people to move outside, get more experience, but also because they want to recruit outside. After all, why, why pay extra to the skills you've already got when you can buy some in? And buy, quite a lot of companies these days actually don't even employ all their skills. Or quite often they buy a lot more skills in, they believe this is more increased flexibility. And this, of course, leads to, in some cases, very highly paid consultants, but in many cases, low pay, insecure work. Human resources, of course, are tasked with finding the right employees to right, fill the right jobs, whether this role is permanent, whether the role is temporary, whether it's a full time contract, or whether it is a part-time pay by results it is up to employees why is it important well let's be quite honest it is quite simply very costly if the job is done wrong well, i'm sure we've all worked with the wrong person in some cases it can be expensive to get rid of them it can also be expensive to retrain them and it can be very psychologically damaging to those people who work alongside them they can find themselves suffering a lot and feeling that they are paying the price for the inability of human resources to get the job right the first time around so it's extremely important that human resources being downstream in the process is the key to make sure this is done right. And so human resources will normally set up their architecture, the way they construct their organization, to plan and design recruitment and selection procedures very, very carefully. So as to make sure they're done properly and they're done within the confines of the organization and can achieve the strategic aims of the organizations. It's also important to do so, which we know as select out. And select out employees is simply where you look for those organizations, employees who are harming your organization, and you look to, at the early stage, remove them in the way that is least damaging to you. And in the case of good organizations, least damaging to them because of being in the wrong job can be very soul destroying. I'm sure we've all done that. I know I have. So it can be quite helpful. Of course, there are also much more negative organizations, which will use a hard R, HR model, which we'll look at later. Who do not who do it in a manner which is only caring about the organisation. So, what actually takes place in the recruitment and selection process? Well, it's through a series of stages we go through. The first stage we have to go through, of course, is we have to define the requirements of the job. And what does that mean? Well, what we tend to carry out is what we call a job analysis. So, you look at the job that's new that's come along, that we want to do it, and we just say, we have to decide who do we want for this job. What position of this job is the guy? What is the actual role of the job? And you also define the so you define the job, but you will also tend to define the person. That's why you see in all the job adverts, you'll see a person specification alongside a job specification. Once you've done that process, the next stage, of course, is to how do you actually get the right people to apply? How do you get people to be attractive, people who want to come to you? And this, of course, is the recruitment stage. And so the recruitment stage is all about attracting the right candidates. And making sure you can attract the right candidates is a prerequisite, of course, of the next stage, which is selection. Because there's no point selecting from the wrong candidates. There's no point trying to select if you haven't attracted the right candidates. So first you have to look, do you attract the candidates? You might do it by advertisement, you may do it by approach, you may do it by hiring a headhunter or hiring a recruitment executive to do it. And once you've done that, you look at the people who have applied and you decide how do we identify from all those people the ones we want. And when you finish, of course, it's very important to work out, look back at it. Have we actually attracted the right person? 
How do we know if we have picked the right person? What can we tell us that tells us we have picked the right person? Well, one thing that can tell us whether we picked the right person or not, of course, is looking at the different ways they've done, how they achieve, how they go back. And for that, of course, we need to collect all the information we can from the stage. Did we attract enough candidates? Did we get enough interest? Was the people that we wanted getting in touch with? Did we identify candidates who were interested? Or did we identify candidates we wanted? And then did they go on to apply? These are all questions we need to ask ourselves. And of course, after that, with the selection out of the people that arrived, did the people we finally select, were they correct ones? And then, of course, there's a feedback process that takes all the things that we've defined, all the things that we've worked on, feeds them back into the defined requirements to make sure that we actually did end up with doing that. And in future, if there's been a problem, we can then redesign the process. So how do we define the role? Well, there are a number of things we need to do. One of the things we need to do is to define the knowledge, the skills, the attitudes, and all the other things that come together based on job analysis to do that. How do we do that? Well, first, we might do that by observation of people who are already doing that, that role or similar roles, or the people will be working with the people in that role. Say, what do you need from the, per, the new person who's going to be brought in? Conduct interviews with those people. You know, talk to them, ask them, say, what is it you're looking for? How are we going to do this for you? You can ask questionnaires of a much broader thing, maybe of customers. What do you expect from the person that's been coming? What do you expect from internal clients, internal customers? What exactly are you expecting them to do within the roles? Collect all this information. But also look at what has been published about other jobs. Other jobs have been analysed, other jobs will be available publications, either in adverts, in strategic publications, in academic publications, in general technical journals. And once you've done that, how do you present that to people? You present it simply, you have a job description that describes and states exactly what the job is going to require. You have a person specification that tells you what the person who's coming into the job needs. Because some things that the job requires will be things you can train them in the house. Some of them will be things you actually want them to be able to do already. And that might be the soil. There might be some things that you would be good if you could do already, but you know that you could train them for essentials. And what you also need is what we call a competency framework, a way of outlining all the different elements that go into the job. And this leads us on to actually how do we attract these applicants? And what do we attract them with? Well, what can we offer them? What is it in our organization that makes people want to come to us? Okay. And there are certainly things of uh, what we can do. So, what organizational effect can we have? What we want to affect is the number of types of applicants that apply for jobs. Broadly speaking, we want to actually attract a lot of applicants so we give a choice and get them in there. But we also want to know whether applicants will accept a job offer because the chance are that there are occasions when we can go through all this process. That certainly happens a lot at the higher levels, maybe some of the areas that you may be doing, not immediately as a graduate, but two or three years down the line. It certainly happens here at the university, at senior lecturer, professor grade. We go to all the effort and expense of bringing people in, of interviewing them, talking to them about the job, and then afterwards we make them an offer and they don't accept it. It's true that some firms, some organisations will always be able to attract better workers. People will always perhaps want to work for Microsoft, not be so keen perhaps on working for a small technical company down the road, might want to work for the big four accountants, Local Joe Bloggs accountancy, maybe not quite so far. I tried about that. As I've been putting out CVs this week that you should not lie on your job application, it is also important that the value proposition a company puts forward does not lie. Because if it does, you will attract the wrong person to the job. You may think, oh, we'll attract somebody better than we actually need, but that person will become disillusioned and may end a lot worse. So give realistic job previews. Tell people exactly what's going to happen. If it requires them to be working very hard, requires them to be closely supervised, if it's a job that requires them to be here on weekends and holidays, tell them. There's no point not telling people they're going to be working weekends and holidays, recruiting them, and they have a family, and then you suddenly tell them you'll have to be coming at weekends. They'll be quite right saying, no, we won't. And that can lead to disputes, this can lead to expenses, and can lead to problems down the line. So be honest about what you're doing, just to expect you as an applicant to be honest in your CV. We expect companies to be honest when appraising their own jobs and making realistic job previews. So what is the recruitment strategy? Well, it basically depends on a, a number of things. It depends on how good your organisation is, and that it's intelligent, how, it's, how creative and proactive it is in recruitment activities, how well it's set up, and the comparative labour market power. If you have an organisation of little creativity but low labour market power, for instance, you're recruiting barristers at perhaps at uh, Starbucks, something like that, and you might seem to be muddling, muddling through but if you're having, you have a low labour market power, but the, the reality is that you can actually, and this might be more true of something like baristas at Starbucks, 
you actually have a very good method of recruiting people who, for instance, who you know are themselves flexible, for instance, students, people with families, people who actually want flexible work. You can actually have great, create a very flexible environment where high organizational intelligence meets up with low labor market power. Of course, this can be positive for some people, but in the vast majority of cases, it's actually negative and has resulted in the market as it is at the moment that is a highly exploitative. If you have low organizational attention but high labor market power, because the old days perhaps of trade unions handling recruitment for you, we create an environment known as the status quo, where eventually workers will tend to settle in to an organization it might not be the great paid, might not be the greatest recruit in the world, but it's reliable, so they will stay there. They could less of that. But where high labor power meets high organizational intelligence, which is what it should do in the case of people like yourselves going for graduate work, then we have what we call innovative and autonomous workers. We have innovative companies trying to design ways that will keep you on board because they, you want to stay, not forced to stay. And by force, you don't necessarily move through slavery, you don't necessarily have the need to earn money, actually, you're enjoying coming to work. And we have workers who are autonomous, able to work on their own, do not need huge amounts of creativity. I've got to the typology of constraints available in Windolf, but also there is further more information available in Olitsky if you want to look up further information about this sort of thing. So, recruitment efforts. These are things that we need to ask ourselves. If we're going to recruit people, where do we find our candidates? There are a number of places. Word of mouth informal, certainly at higher levels. Don't ignore this. This can be very important to bring the right person in. I've just recruited some of this department, a uh, temporary lecturer. It was done based on an informal contact subject and you from elsewhere. There are also things like formal personal contacts, which can be uh, open days at your level, could be career fairs. We need to target our advertising. It's expensive. How effective is it these days? If you go to newspapers and trade press, radio, trade press certainly is effective, but the internet, maybe local TV, might be more effective than you could imagine. Many companies outsource recruitment these days. It could be consultancies, recruitment agencies, consultancies, it could be job centers, things like that. And don't forget social media. You will be given an opportunity to set up a LinkedIn account that we will look at and help you with. You must do that. But also be aware of, be careful with your Facebook account. Try and use a name that isn't easily found so that anything that's going on around your Facebook account, picture of you perhaps enjoying yourself at university, which is perfectly acceptable. Don't let people tell you you should not be doing this because it might turn up, but just be wary of what you put on social media. Unfortunately, many companies will go to social media now and they won't necessarily check whether they're, what they're seeing is a really true representation of what happened. So keep to the professional social media. Make sure if you have professional social media accounts, that's probably the best places that you should be looking at, so for instance, LinkedIn.